let's get to our assignment, our assignment today. Let's get to our assignment. Uh, this month, as Pastor Jamie has spoken already, is, is, is us inhabiting rest. What does rest feel like? What does it look like? Rest is more than just going to sleep, picking a nap. Uh, being able to rest in God, being able to get away. Yeah, you need to steal away. You need that me time. Everybody needs that me time. And if you're with somebody in relationship that does not allow you to have me time, you are in a dangerous relationship. Let me say, everybody, the only person who can be with you 24-7 is God. Everyone needs some, say, me time. Me time. So I love you, but I need some me time. Me time does not mean sin time. Me time does not mean S-I-N. Me time does not mean sin time. Me time means I need some me time. And so looking at our text today, I want to kind of go back. The last week I preached from the sermon, When Life Wears You Out. Um, there's a way, there's, the, there's a principle in which God gives to all of us as believers. Now, we can either adhere to the principle uh, and bless God and glorify him, or we can ignore the principle and make life harder. I shared with you last week my trip to Ghana. Uh, the first flight going to Ghana was very helpful. It was very good. Um, it was going from Ghana, going from D.C. Um, straight to Ghana, to Togo, and from Togo into uh, to Ghana itself, Accra. But coming back, I, I took a different route. Uh, they took me the cheek route. I went from Ghana to Ethiopia, from Ethiopia to, um, to Rome, and from Rome to D.C. Now, some of y'all are saying, well, that's a nice trip. You went to Ghana, to Ethiopia. I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't stay in Ethiopia. I just went through Ethiopia. I mean, no, no big deal. And Ethiopia, then went to Rome. I mean, you know, I didn't get off the flight at Rome. I just stayed and they refueled. And it took 21 hours to get home. The first flight took 10. Why am I sharing this with you? Because, because the destination got me to the same place. I got to the same destination. But the journey was different. So some of us, some of us are having turbulent journeys because we have not learned to cast things on God. Some of us are having, you know, all of us will have challenges that we must decide, life or death, blessings or curses. That's your decision. I don't care what you say. Everyone has a decision, life or death, blessings or cursing. And so that flight from Ghana uh, coming back home was 21 hours, and I was in a row, 44 row, I was in seat 44 rows. 44C, I was in the middle of two extended people. They were so selfish, I had no armrest. I don't know why folk think that because you're in the middle, you get no access to armrest. I wanted to be indignant, but there was too many people on the plane that looked like me. And so I'm speaking of the journey the journey was different, same destination. But what determines your journey? What determines your ride? All of us have some bumpy rides every now and then. The Bible is vividly clear, but there are principles that help us govern ourselves when these rides become turbulent. And they're heavy. And that's what I want to finish teaching on today. How do you ride out the storm? How do you actually ride out the storm? Now, for those of you who aren't in a storm right now, we praise and bless God for you. I'm not going to be like haters who say, keep on living, you're going to see sooner or later. That's, hate, that's haterism. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, we bless God for your journey right now because your journey um, doesn't have as much turbulence. So come on with me in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. I won't hold you long today. The Gospel of Matthew, come on and stand with me as a sign of when the word is spoken, we change our posture. It is more than physical for me right now. This is not a physical stand. It's, so when you read God's word, it ought to change your mental, spiritual posture. Building religion, building habits, that's what religion is. Religion is not my faith. My faith comes to Christ. Jesus is my savior. My religious activity helps me to sustain my faith. 
which means that if I'm a believer, I need certain things. If, if I want my teeth longer in my mouth, I have certain habits that I must build. So when you brush your teeth, it's a habit because then, and, and you floss, you get rid of genovitis. You get rid of gum disease. Hello, walk with me. And so that's building a habit because I want good hygiene and healthy teeth and gums. So I build a habit out of my choice. My choice is a healthy mouth. So I add habits, which call religion, to what my decision is to, to help me embrace and enhance my decision to walk with God. You're walking with God, but you don't have anything to help you sustain it. No, real, no, no habits. You don't pray regular, regularly. Okay, y'all got that? Can I move on now? Okay, y'all got it. So you got to build up a religion to help you spiritually. All right. Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, Message Bible. It says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on church and religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it, says the Lord. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Everybody ought to say, praise the Lord. Come on, you may take your seats. Today, I want to lead us into a conversation, the God that lightens your load. The God that lightens your load. Matthew's gospel in chapter 11 basically is a holistic summary of God's promise. God's promise of rest, God's promise of relief. It is, it is not strange that God sets the example. Not just today, but in creation story, the narrative tells us that God made everything in six days and on the seventh day God chilled. God took a moment to say, I'm resting. It wasn't that God was tired because God is omnipotent. He's all powerful. He doesn't wear out. He doesn't get weary. It wasn't that God didn't have any, any other thoughts because God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. All, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. It wasn't that God simply wanted to demonstrate that I've done enough. No, God just said, I respect what I've done. And even though I'll do more in building what I've created up, I take my Sabbath and I rest. Sabbath isn't about just going to church. Sabbath is having a day in which you allow God to renew you and to regenerate your life. Because if you know, like I know, people in life can really wear you out. I shared with you last week, not only the bad things, bad things can wear you out, but the good things, responsibilities can wear you out. Having to work 40 hours a week just to make sure you're able to pay the rent. That's a good thing, but it wears you out because I got to work 40 hours just to pay the rent. It's a good thing that we're able to do certain things in life, but even the good things of life, even the blessings of life, even what God gives us at some point becomes responsible, responsibilities. Every blessing that God has given you, you must be responsible in managing. I don't care what it is, you can't name me one thing that God has given you. If you say, God bless me with this day, then God says rejoice and be glad in it, which means that God is saying, I need you to be responsible in the gift that I've given you. And if you allow anybody, even yourself, to mess it up, I fought you. Everything that God has given to you, the baby dedication today, God blessed Jasmine's womb with the seed of Isaiah's, Isaiah's seed. God blessed the womb. Now God says, I have given you the miracle. Now I need for you to manage him. 
I need for you to understand that life is not always easy, and, and if it was easy, you would not need me. Do you understand what God is doing? God is creating a need for himself by putting you in a world that has uncertainties and inconsistencies. God creates a need for him because you and I cannot do it apart from him. Now, I know you're sitting here, but all of us have tried to do it apart from God. We've tried to solve our own problems. We've tried to answer our own questions. We've tried to straighten out our own crooked path just to find out we needed assistance. It doesn't matter whether you're clergy, bishop, priest, potentate, grand pooper, it doesn't matter if you're usher, a missionary, it does not matter, all of us need God. And God starts to create in our environment, in our atmosphere, areas where we find out I cannot do this apart from God, my strength. Now, this word is important because as we look at it, it tells us some things. The Bible is very vivid today. In Matthew 11, it says Jesus is talking, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religious activity but no personal relationship? Are you burned out with singing but the songs don't resonate? Are you burned out with coming to Sunday morning, every Sunday morning, but yet there is a lack of worship and enthusiasm in your praise? What's happening in your life? But then notice something. Are you tired? Because you look tired. You sound tired. Are you worn out? You act like they have worn you out, burned you out. Are you burned out on religion? Then notice something. The invitation says, come to me. Now, I want you to pray with me right here because it says, come to me. Jesus gives us this profound invitation. He offers us rest. He offers us comfort. He offers us to unload the weariness of life that all of us have to handle. He allows us to come to him. And I want you to work with me and help me because he's saying, because you are so overwhelmed. You are so overwhelmed. You are over taxed, you, you are overextended, you, you are overexposed. And now he says, in order for me to get the glory, I need you to operate at your optimal process. Now y'all pray with me, because the Lord says, let your light shine before men and women that they might see your what? Your good works, but give me glory, which means that if God isn't, if we aren't allowing our light to shine, then we are withholding God's glory. God wants you to shine. God wants you to glorify him. He wants the world to know that he can take a mess up and give them a message. God, 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 God wants, God, God wants us to shine, that he gets the glory. Our works are seen by people, but they give God the glory. God does not want you on the sideline being hopeless and in despair because life has dealt you a bad hand. The truth be told, everyone on your road at some point in time has been dealt a bad hand. I dare you to look at your, your neighbor and say, neighbor, play the hand you've been dealt. Play the hand you've been dealt because the Apostle Paul says you got to learn some things about this life. Learn to be content, which means that God ought to get the glory whether I feel better or feel worse. Y'all pray with me if you will. Y'all, y'all, y'all help me out. So therefore, the writer of Matthew declares unto us Jesus' words, come unto me, all ye that labor. And what I love about this is Jesus recognizes that the people are tired, they're worn out, and they are burned out on religious activity. Now, I, I must be honest, here it is, because some folk will not allow you to be sacredly human. Some folk won't allow you to be sacredly human or a God man or a God woman. They want you to be their superhero every day, 24-7, not understanding that I am clothed in this physical body that has limitations, that can be drained, that can be discouraged, depressed, oppressed, and overwhelmed. There are some people who are so lazy that they will not try for themselves, but I hope you will become the glue they need in order to keep things together. But if you fall for that prank, 
If you fall and believe that you are the glue that keeps everything together, why not allow other folk to dump on you? Because you are born into the riddle of life. You are not the glue. The only glue we have that is consistent and permanent is Jesus Christ, is God. No one else can be your superhero but God. Uh, y'all just missed that. Y'all just missed that. I'm sorry. Am I getting too excited already? Am I getting too excited? Y'all pray with me. I, what, what I love about this text, quick, quickly, what I love about this text is this. Jesus acknowledges their feelings. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are, are you burnt out on religion? So what, what happens? Jesus is aware. He acknowledges their feelings. He acknowledges their overload. He doesn't Say to them, man up. He has some compassion. He has some grace. He has some mercy. So for those of you who simply tell your friends, man up, sometimes they need to man up. But sometimes even man up cannot get them out of their dilemma. It takes a holy intervention. Y'all pray with me. I'm coming, y'all, y'all. It takes an holy intervention. So don't get mad at me because I can't hold you up. I ought not get mad at you because you cannot carry my total weight. People are heavy. Matter of fact, I don't need anyone else to make my life more complicated when I got me. I complicate my own life. I complicate my hours, my days, my weeks. I can complicate myself so much, I can talk myself out of a blessing. And what God is saying to us today is that we want to really glorify him and be his examples on earth. We had to learn some biblical and spiritual principle on how to manage life when life is trying to manage us. Are y'all, y'all still with me? Can we just jump into this? I'm excited. So here it is. Jesus acknowledges their feelings. He acknowledges their overload. He doesn't make them feel ashamed of where they are in life. He doesn't make them feel you ought to know better. No, 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 no. Sometimes church folk get on my last nerve. God from Zion. Sometimes people who are who are who claim to be in Christ don't understand the frailties of our connection. If I had everything going on in my life, I wouldn't need God. I got some crooked places. I got some low places. I got some rough places. I got some places with no carpet on the floor. Torn up, I got some places in my life that if you look closely, you will run away. But I'm so thankful that God does not turn away from our ugliness. He faces our ugliness. He sees our demons. He recognizes the thing that we have not yet gotten right. He understands that we are tired, worn out, bent over, trained, tapped out, giving up. He knows that we are about to lose our mind. And God says, I'm here to intervene for you. Okay, y'all don't get that? And I'm grateful that he allows us to be human, but not stay in a place of victimization. This word is for somebody here, because God does not want us in a place of victimization. He sees your hurt. He sees you're torn up. He sees you're worn out. He sees you're tired of religious activity. But he also says, I see you, but do you see me? He cares, listen, he cares about your feelings. He cares about how you are going through. He just doesn't want to get you to heaven. If all he wanted was to get you to heaven, the day you were born again, he would have blinked his eye and you would have been at heaven's gate. 
So why does God allow me to stay here and go through the stuff I'm going through? But the Bible says in this world, you're going to have some trials and tribulations, but you represent me. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome, y'all need, y'all got to help me, I have overcome what? The world. So we ought to give God glory by recognizing the stuff we're in, but hearing God's voice come unto me. All ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you some peace. I will give you rest in the middle of your chaos. I'll give you peace in the middle of your confusion. I'll give you help in the middle of your discomfort. This is what God is saying. Not what I'm saying because I can't be to you what only God can be to you. He's my alpha and my omega, the beginning and the end. He paid the sin debt on Calvary Cross to rescue you from the grip of Satan. He's the one who makes Satan his footstool and we stand in the name of Jesus and we have victory. How can you have victory if you are unwilling to conquer anything? I'm sorry, I'm getting, Paul, I'm getting excited, y'all, getting, getting emotional. I gotta get y'all out of here. But Jesus, first of all, he acknowledges their emotions, he acknowledges their feelings. Feelings are not right or wrong, it's just how I feel about an experience. It's what I do with those feelings can bring me into a place of obedience or disobedience into a place of right or wrong, into a place of help or being hindered. It is how I handle my emotions, my feelings. I can't let my feelings dictate because we walk not by feelings, but we walk by faith. Not by sight, but by faith. Not by my emotions, but by faith. Not by facts, but by faith. Because God overrides facts and say what the enemy meant for evil, facts, he turned those things around and made those things good for you. So let me get on, hasten on to my points here because I really want to help you because he says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burnt out on religion? Notice something. Look at the profound invitation. He's inviting not healthy folk, Look at what he's doing. I know you're saying, well, he, he wants me to get better and he invite me to the party because he doesn't want dead. No, no. What Jesus does is unlike what we do. We invite people who, who add value to our party. Jesus adds value to the people he invites to the party. Y'all y'all just missed that. Y'all just missed that then. Y'all, y'all. No, no, no. What, what am I saying? is that notice who he gives a, in, an invitation to. Not those who are just shouting on Sunday morning, not just those who are clapping and praising, those can come too. But even if you're worn out and torn down, I want to invite you to come to me. Now come to him means something important. Come to him as you are because he knows where you are, he knows how you feel, he knows what you're experiencing, and there is no need to lie to God. You know, I know because if I lie to God, I think God's going to start at a different plateau of my life. And God says, no, you want me to be as fictional with you as you are with me. Y'all, y'all got it. Y'all, y'all, y'all got it. So you want God to start on a, on a level that you know good is where you ain't on. Well, I'm going to call those things that are not as though they are. You are? Okay. God does not need for you to lie to yourself in order to see his strength. Okay? So the word come, this is the invitation. I want to move on because, because come to him, which means if you come to me, I'll help you deal with your worry. Because it's important here. Because worry can hinder your physical health. 
Chronic worry can lead to stress-related conditions like headaches, migraines, digestive problems, muscle tension, even cardiovascular issues. Because why? I am worried over something and it's internalized and now my body is paying the price. Y'all see it with me? Can I have two more minutes and I'll be done? Okay. It also, worry can strain your mental health. How many of you like me? I have enough going on up here. I have enough going on up here day after day, and worry does not help me get through my day. Worry is a projection on what might happen that I know I can't fix. You are worried about something that you know you can't fix, but you still wear it. Can I be honest with you? I'm almost there. Arrogance and victimization are similar. Because both require you to lift you. Y'all help me, y'all, okay. Church folk talk more about arrogance than they do about victimization. Woe is me, life can't get no better. If it wasn't for bad luck, I have no luck at all. <laughs> no, no, y'all see, y'all still here? Victimization and arrogance requires the same level of energy. It focuses on me and not my strength. Arrogance says, I can do anything I want to do anytime to anybody. I'm this, I'm that, I'm bad. I am, I am a slice of bread with peanut butter and jelly rolled on top. Arrogance says, I don't need nobody. I am it. It focuses on the personal pronoun, me. It's, it's me. It's, it's I. But when you feel as though you are a victim, it does the same thing that someone who's arrogant because now I'm not this, I ain't nothing. I ain't gonna never have nothing. I ain't gonna never make it out of this turmoil. Life just ain't meant to have me. Maybe I should just go on somewhere else because this ain't working for me. No, no, no. God is saying, you gotta work through some stuff. Walk with me, work with me. His word said, walk with me, work with me because you got potential in your life. But if you don't use it the right way, your oppression can lead you into depression. Okay, y'all, okay, I'm, I'm almost there. Angie, I'm, I promise you, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Worry also impairs your decision making. Anybody can, can, can testify to that? How many of you wish you could take some back you did? <laughs> Rest of y'all lying. It's Tron, Tron, it's just you and I, it's just us together. Nobody else understands that. How many of y'all really wish you could take it back you, you said it, you did it, you really wish you could take it back. You made a wrong decision, it was a wrong action. You reacted out of something, but now, because God is saying you didn't wait, you didn't, you didn't be still enough, you didn't have rest, you were agitated to move out of your alignment with God. You, you, were, you were pressured into making a decision that did not have to be made at the moment, because don't you ever allow someone else's emergency to become yours. Baby, baby, I know you're in trouble, but it ain't got nothing to do with me. I'm praying for you, but I can't make a decision, a life or death decision, when I am in the middle of turmoil myself. I love you enough to carry you to Jesus because Jesus got everything you need. Baby, I'm in this thing with you. We both need a savior. We both need a Lord. We both need a redeemer. We both need a healer. We both need a deliverer. We both need a fulfillment. We need somebody who's stronger than us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Christ is saying, I get it. I get it. I get it. 
in this world, I get you tired. I get you worn out. Even if you don't say anything, even if you paint the joke of smile on your face, God knows your heart. Even if you can paint it on and, and fool the world, what does it profit a man or a woman to fool the whole world and lose their soul? You are faking it. You are faking it so much God can't even speak truth to you because you do not know truth. You have faked it so long you call fake truth it's okay not to be okay especially when I can go to Jesus and tell God all about my trials and tell God about my fixations and tell God about my habits and watch God work on me it may not come in one day it may not come in one month it may not come in one year but if I just hold on One of these days, God's going to help you break that habit. But you have to keep coming to him. Coming to me. No, 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 I don't know where I'm going with this. Coming to me, all ye who labor. And are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then his word says, learn. Learn of me. Learn of me. Just don't, just don't experience good times with me. Learn how I handle life. Learn how I respect my father. Learn how I trust him, even when I don't know what to do. Learn, don't just come to church and clap and have a good time. Learn something. Because the enemy is hoping that all you have is emotional outbursts. The enemy is hoping all you have is an emotional outburst. Either you're capping and you're shouting or you're crying and you're slobbing over your defeat. And the enemy is happy when there's no word in your mind. There's no word in your soul. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. That when I'm in trouble, I don't run from trouble, but I run to Jesus. Thy word have I hid in my heart and the heart is not here. The heart is here. I hid that word in my heart. So when the enemy came, the Spirit of God raised up a Holy Ghost standard. And the enemy could not get to me because of the Holy Ghost intervention in your life, in my life. Uh, I'm sorry, y'all. I am so sorry. I'm, getting, I'm all emotional, y'all. I'm too loud and I'm emotional. But I'm grateful. That, that transformation requires learning. Discipleship requires learning. It doesn't just require your emotions. It requires you to learn something. So when the devil comes in and says, turn this stone into bread, you will say that the devil, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. When the enemy comes and, lurk and lures you in with some enticement, you will say, man cannot entice me where God has kept me. This whole thing, church, is I, it's, it's, I, I. so God, God is willing to say, come. And you don't have to come in the best condition. <laughs> I remember years ago when I started getting back at the church, you know, I got saved, you know, I, we won't do it. I, I mean, I'm being honest, I, I was doing weed and weed won't heal in me. And, and, and I, I came to church as I was. I, I had a fifth of Dr. Bacardi rum and an ounce in my car. But God says, come on to me just as you are. Because people were, people were telling me, well, fix this and then come. If I can fix it on my own, I ain't coming. I want you to be holy. But understand, your holiness still got some holes in it. I want you to be righteous. But understand, the only way you are justified is through the blood of Jesus. I want you to be sanctified. 
but it's not your dress. It's not your garments. It's not your vocabulary. Consecration requires submission. This word says, if you are heavy, give it to me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so, in closing, church, when I was in Ghana, the dollar in Ghana is worth more than their currency. They are called CDs. My dollar was worth a whole lot more than their CDs. I want you to understand this. When you come to God, what God has for you is of much more value than what you have for yourself. I don't have to be in debt, nor do I have to be a millionaire to understand that I'm rich in Jesus. I just have to learn the proper stewardship principles to help me not spend all my money on things I want and then beg for what I need. In church, as I close, he says, take my yoke, it's easy. And a yoke is a wooden instrument that is tied on two animals. And sometimes one animal is stronger than the other, but a yoke kind of balances things out. I'm so thankful that we don't have a God who's intimidated by your needs. He's willing to share his strength with you. Y'all don't get this, do you? You don't get this, do you? He's willing, but if you don't come, you will never know that trouble won't last always. If you don't come, you will never know you could have been healed a long time ago. If you don't come, you will never know that God had made a way for you. If you don't come, you will never know that he is the atonement for your sin. If you don't come, you will never know that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. But when you come, he says, take my currency. My currency is much more valuable than what you brought to the table. <laughs> and he will. So I'm saying to you today, church, it's not just a destination. Because I see a whole lot of y'all get to the destination and you shouting, praise the Lord, bless the Lord. You complain the whole time through. I ain't help nobody. <laughs> and I, I, believe me, I don't mind complaining. There's one song that would not sing at my funeral. The song, I Won't Complain. I won't complain. That's a lie. I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to vent. I'm going to vent. I'm going to let you know you're getting to my nerves. I'm going to let you know I messed up. I'm going to vent. <laughs> but I, I never will have the spirit of complaint. I never will have the spirit of complaint because God has been too wonderful. It's not magic. It's not magic. It is God's purposeful design to show you his sovereignty. And so church, as I close, Pastor Jamie, can you help me today, man? My, my throat is, is uh, I've been too long, but I was watching the Olympics the other day and, and, the, and the Olympics had uh, a, a young lady from Germany, uh, a shot putter. Uh, the, the entire time she was lagging behind, she threw and she fell, which really hindered her throw, her distance. And, 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 and as she went back to her seat, they saw her mumbling and saying something. She's from Germany. She went with the intentions to win gold, but right now, she was in almost last place. She, she, there was nothing that she could do. They, they, they didn't think that she could do anything because she had one more throw. Say one more throw. One more throw. That's all I need is one more throw. She had one more throw. And when she got to her seat, got to her place, they saw her singing. And they asked her, what were you singing? What were you doing? 
She was saying, I, I failed and I could have given up, but I had one more throw. You can Google this today, make sure I'm telling you the truth. She started singing this song by Kirk Carr. I almost let go. She's, she's losing, she's losing now. She's not a contender for the gold, not a contender at the moment, had one more throw. She went to her seat and she said, I started to sing. I almost let go. I felt like I just couldn't take life anymore. My problems had me bound. Depression weighed me down. But God held me close so I wouldn't let go. God, she kept on singing, God's mercy kept me so I wouldn't let go. I almost gave up. I was right at the edge of a breakthrough, but I couldn't see it. The devil really had me, but Jesus came and grabbed me and he held me close so I wouldn't let go. God's mercy kept me so I wouldn't let go. So I'm here today because God kept me. I'm alive today only because of his grace. Oh, he kept me so I wouldn't, wouldn't let go. I'm finished, y'all, and y'all can make up the rest of it. Come here. But notice something. It says, the devil almost had me. But Jesus came and grabbed me. He grabbed me, hold on, hold on. he grabbed me and held me close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't. Let go. Hold on, y'all, y'all ain't getting there yet. He, the devil thought he had me. But Jesus, woo, he, y'all just missed that, I'm sorry. He, he grabbed me. Because the devil was pulling me that way. But Jesus, with force, grabbed me. And then he held me close. And it looked like I wouldn't let go, but really he didn't let me go because he held me close. So wherever he moved, oh, help me Lord. Wherever he went, because he grabbed me out of the hand of Satan, he grabbed me out of the hand of depression. He grabbed me! Just take a few moments and give God praise for his keeping power.